Moana 2 and the Death of Disney Just a few days ago, on February 7th, it was announced that Disney is planning to release a sequel to their 2016 film, Moana, in November. Something that came as a total surprise, as the project was originally slated to be an animated TV series in a similar vein as Rapunzel's Tangled Adventure. Ordinarily, this isn't the type of thing I'd make an entire video about. After all, Disney announces films all the time. But this project is indicative of a larger issue that's plaguing the company, and that's cowardice. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, but the problem with the modern era of Disney is that it's glaringly obvious that they're entirely driven by monetary gain, instead of a genuine desire to create movie magic, which is largely because the people running the show aren't artists, but businessmen. Before someone comments, well obviously, they're a company, I feel the need to point out that Walt Disney himself once said, quote, We don't make movies to make money. We make money to make more movies. And if you actually know the history of the company, that couldn't be more accurate. Their first feature-length film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, entered production in 1934, smack dab in the middle of the Great Depression. The film cost over a million dollars to make, an absurd amount for the time period, and Walt wound up pooling all of the company's resources into the project, put his own house up as collateral, and took out a $250,000 loan. For years, people warned him that he was making a huge mistake, that the film would never succeed, and he'd wind up bankrupt. But Walt knew that he wanted to make something that had never been seen before. He wanted to change the world. And when the film was finally released in 1937, it was immediately clear that he had a hit on his hands, with Snow White quickly earning back $8 million. However, this critical and commercial success didn't mean that the company was set. And when their next two films, Pinocchio and Fantasia, failed to turn a profit, they once again found themselves on the verge of bankruptcy. World War II didn't help the situation in the slightest, as many of the company's staff members were drafted, but Disney made an arrangement with the US government to create propaganda films in order to keep the company afloat until the dust settled. For nearly a decade, the company continued to struggle financially, being over $4 million in debt by 1947, and they continued to make cheap and simple anthology films in an attempt to break even. Walt was vocal about his unhappiness with the quality of work the studio had been producing, and fought to return to the full-length fairy tale format that had succeeded in Snow White. He knew that this was a risky move, as the failure of this pricey project effectively guaranteed that he'd have to close down the studio, but he went for it anyway. In 1950, Cinderella hit theaters and was Disney's biggest hit in over a decade, and the incredible financial success of the film, in addition to the sales of merchandise, brought in enough money that Walt was able to finance several films, establish his own distribution company, and begin construction on Disneyland. With Walt turning his attention towards the theme park and away from animation, many of the films released in the 1960s were considered critical or commercial disappointments. But because Disneyland was turning such a profit, they were able to continue as they were. On December 15, 1966, Walt Disney passed away, and the company struggled creatively without their founder, making very few animated films over the course of the 1970s, with the vast majority performing poorly and failing to capture the Disney magic. This wasn't helped by the fact that longtime animator Don Bluth left the company to start his own rival studio, taking several animators with him. It almost seemed as though Disney was fated to be remembered for its rides instead of its movies. In the 1980s, the company's reputation had soured due to their lackluster film releases, resulting in a significant dip in profits. And in 1984, after buying out one of their shareholders, they were in debt for $866 million, forcing them back into the arms of the medium that had saved them time and time again, animation. That same year, Michael Eisner was appointed as CEO, bringing in Jeffrey Katzenberg as chairman and Walt's nephew, Roy, as head of the animation division. Roy had previously resigned from the company in 1977 following disagreements over corporate decision-making, saying, quote, I just felt creatively the company wasn't going anywhere interesting. It was very stifling. The first film produced entirely under this new leadership was The Great Mouse Detective in 1986, which wound up being one of Disney's first financial successes in years. This continued with Oliver and Company in 1988, and combined with the successful films released by their other divisions, they were able to pull themselves out of debt once again. In 1989, they released The Little Mermaid, which was considered a true return to form for the company and jump-started the Disney Renaissance. 
Over the course of the 1990s, the company released several films which dominated the box office, allowing them to earn back their reputation as one of the greatest animation studios in the world. It was during this time that they established Disney Toon Studios, which was tasked with producing direct-to-video sequels of Renaissance-era films to not only profit off of their popularity, but also the growth of the home video market. The first of these sequels was The Return of Jafar in 1994, which despite receiving negative reviews, became one of the best-selling videos of all time, grossing more than $300 million on a budget of about $5 million. Although subsequent direct-to-video releases weren't nearly as successful, they were still profitable, giving the company an incentive to continue producing them regardless of their actual quality. The Disney Television Animation Division was given a similar mission, creating sequel, prequel, and spin-off TV series that featured the brand's most popular characters. Many industry insiders felt as though this was a risky move, as most TV cartoons hadn't turned a significant profit. But by taking a gamble on higher budget productions, Disney was able to raise the standard for the medium while also strengthening their brand image. Notably, before his death, Walt Disney had expressed an interest in creating an animated TV series, but had felt it was economically unfeasible at the time. So in a way, they were kind of fulfilling his dream. While Walt Disney had been positive about venturing into TV animation, he'd made his stance on sequels very clear, saying in a letter to the company's shareholders just a few months before he passed in 1966, quote, Many people have asked, why don't you make another Mary Poppins? Well, by nature, I'm a born experimenter. To this day, I don't believe in sequels. I can't follow popular cycles. I have to move on to new things. There are so many new worlds to conquer. As a matter of fact, people have been asking us to make sequels ever since Mickey Mouse first became a star. We have bowed only on one occasion to the cry to repeat ourselves. The Three Little Pigs was an enormous hit, and the cry went up, give us more pigs. I couldn't see how we could possibly top pigs with pigs but we tried, and I doubt whether any of you reading this can name the other cartoons in which the pigs appeared. We didn't make the same mistake with Snow White. When it was a huge hit, the shout went up for more dwarves. Top dwarves with dwarves? Why try? Right now, we're not thinking about making another Mary Poppins. We never will. Perhaps there will be other ventures with equal critical and financial success, but we know we can't hit a home run with the bases loaded every time we go to the plate. We also know the only way we can even get to first base is by constantly going to bat and continuing to swing. And so we're always looking for new ideas and new stories. Besides refusing to sell out, see how he acknowledges that making art is risky, but that doesn't mean it isn't worth trying. Unfortunately, it's become very clear that the people currently running the show at Disney don't feel the same way. Besides going directly against Walt's wishes by making a lackluster sequel to Mary Poppins, the company has also proceeded to release more and more animated sequels over the course of the 21st century. As we mentioned, the company has been making sequels since the 1990s, but at least by releasing them direct-to-video, they showed an awareness of those movies' quality. But today, we're seeing more and more sequels that are blatant cash grabs being given a wide release, despite it being obvious that corners have been cut. Now, some of them are good, like the original Toy Story trilogy, but the fourth movie was a total dud, and I shudder to think about what the upcoming fifth movie could possibly be about. Other sequels like Ralph Breaks the Internet and Frozen 2 fall somewhere in the they're fine camp, but it's largely dependent on how much you like the original film to begin with. For me, these sequels are forgettable at best. In the last five years, Disney's most profitable film was Frozen 2, while Luca, Soul, Raya and the Last Dragon, Strange World, Turning Red, and Wish all performed below expectations. While these were original stories, thank God, the films themselves wound up feeling like they were made with a paint-by-numbers kit, just checking off all of the boxes of things that Disney thinks we want to see. And this formulaic quality is pretty off-putting, resulting in projects that are completely devoid of the Disney magic we know and love. And I want to make it clear, I don't think this is the fault of the people who are actually making the film. They're doing their best. But with the studio heads repeatedly sticking their noses where they don't belong and forcing changes that actively worsen the project, it's an uphill battle. Keep in mind that Bob Iger, Disney's current CEO, is responsible for the company's acquisition of Pixar, Marvel Entertainment, and Lucasfilms, giving them control over the MCU, Star Wars, and Indiana Jones. 
While this was an undeniably lucrative business decision, Iger's leadership has resulted in less and less positive reception as time has passed, in large part because the projects he moves forward with are the ones that he believes will make money, not ones that he believes people will genuinely enjoy, although it does seem as though that strategy is finally starting to backfire, with many of the Disney-owned properties underperforming in recent years thanks to burnout. Unfortunately, these poor box office numbers have been completely misinterpreted by the clueless multimillionaire. Instead of recognizing that the public is begging for unique stories that are actually thought out, they've decided to just give us more of the same, believing that by directly replicating a story, they can replicate its financial success. Which yes, has worked out for them, but my god is it boring. Since 2010, Disney has been churning out live-action remakes of their most successful films, some being more creative than others. While the worst of the bunch have gone straight to streaming, many of the ones released in theaters have turned a profit, and just like the direct-to-video era, that's only prompted the development of even more of them. Disney has confirmed that nearly a dozen of their films are set to be remade in live action, with some of the most bizarre examples being Lilo and Stitch, Bambi, and the Aristocats. What a nightmare. Animated sequels also make up a large portion of Disney's upcoming film roster, with Inside Out, Zootopia, Frozen, and Toy Story all having sequels in the works. The most recent film to be slated for the shoddy sequel treatment is Moana, which I don't have very high hopes for. Originally announced in 2020 as a TV series, Bob Iger recently decided to retool the concept into a full-length film, and he made the reason behind this change pretty clear. Quote, the original Moana film from 2016 recently crossed 1 billion hours streamed on Disney+, and was the most streamed movie of 2023 on any platform in the US. Along with the live-action version of the original film that's currently in development, Moana remains an incredibly popular franchise, and we can't wait to give you more of Moana and Maui. It's honestly hilarious how much he doesn't care about the actual story, just the viewership. A lighthearted TV spinoff that followed Maui could have been fun for the kids, but that doesn't mean we needed an entire sequel film, especially considering the current plot, which is, after receiving an unexpected call from her wayfinding ancestors, Moana must journey to the far seas of Oceania and into dangerous long-lost waters for an adventure unlike anything she's ever faced. How is that any different from the first movie? Disney also confirmed that Lin-Manuel Miranda, who wrote the music for the 2016 film, wouldn't be returning, with Barlow and Bear, of the unofficial Bridgerton musical fame, replacing him. Now admittedly, I'm not a huge fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda's music, but there's no denying that that was a huge part of Moana's initial success, and I do wonder how that change is going to impact the film. Just last year, Disney announced that a live-action remake of the original Moana film was in development, with Dwayne Johnson set to reprise his role, while Ali'i Cravalho wouldn't be. However, following the announcement of this surprise sequel film, I wonder if the live-action remake gets put on hold, unless Bob Iger genuinely thinks that people would be interested in paying to see two Moana movies in less than a year. Much like they are with the MCU, it feels like Disney is pushing for quantity instead of quality, and as a result, there understandably isn't enough time for anyone to actually make anything that's good. Considering Disney is known to exploit its employees, I genuinely wonder about the workload they have ahead of them, because turning three episodes of a TV show into a feature film in only nine months sounds crazy. Disney has had its fair shares of highs and lows when it comes to their films, often directly correlating to who's in charge, resulting in entire eras that are seen as good or bad. 30 years from now, I think this period will probably be considered the latter. I know people are going to say that if I don't like the movies, then I don't have to watch them, and that's definitely true. But as someone who has been a Disney fan since they were a child, and who actually respects their past, I wish that they'd put more effort into films they're making in the present. As a company that is worth well over $200 billion, they can afford to take a few risks, and Bob Iger wouldn't even have to put his house down as collateral. I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!